Hello, this is Albert van Dijk and in this video I want to talk about satellite calibration and validation. So, um, you might ask yourself how can we measure reflectances uh, uh, as accurately as we can? You know, how do we uh, have a reference for that? Uh, because we can measure how much light is uh, coming uh, back at the satellite, but we can't necessarily measure how much light uh, what came from the Sun in the first place. So how do we do that? Well, one of the ways we do that is uh, through sensor calibration. So um, uh, sensor cal calibration serves two purposes with optical remote sensing. One is to look at the um, uh, basically the arrangement of, uh, of uh, little uh, uh, sensors uh, on the instrument to see if uh, they can provide a sharp view. So you're looking at uh, uh, you know, whether you can identify objects where you meet the specifications of the sensor. Uh, and the other one is to actually look at um, uh, 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 surfaces of known reflectance properties uh, and determining if uh, the, you know uh, calibrating the sensor to those known properties so we can have an absolute value of uh, of reflectance. So in the top graph, in the top pictures here, you see from the uh, from the air or from the satellite, in fact, uh, a number of uh, uh, test patterns, if you like, that are used to basically test the sharpness of the uh, of the satellite image, basically to see that it does what it ought to be doing. And these places really exist, they're, they're big uh, patterns laid out in the landscape. In the bottom picture here you see typical uh, exercise in sensor calibration as it might happen in Australia where a group of people uh, from CSIRO in this case goes out to uh, often a salt lake, Lake Frome probably here, uh, lays out a big tarpaulin uh, and uh, waits for the sensor to pass over. They, they measure the spectral properties uh, on the location and then compare those with what the satellite is measuring. And that's how we calibrate the sensor. Um, another thing we have to think about when using satellite data is, uh, is the uh, image uh, uh, georeferencing, geocoding, and rectification. So these are different terms for somewhat similar processes. So geometrical correction basically means that um, you assign a coordinate system to the image. So you, uh, uh, you know where it is. Uh, and you warp, if necessary, the image to fit the, uh, the known locations. Um, Georeferencing uh, is very similar, but it's, it's uh, 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 called geocoding also because that is actually providing that, that same information that you, that you, you, know, that, uh, you used before uh, to, um, to, to create uh, image coordinate information that the computer can understand, basically. So, um, the two are very related. Of course, you have to do a geometrical correction be before you can do uh, proper georeferencing uh, normally. Uh, further, then, ortho rectification uh, is somewhat slightly more complicated business. That's where you basically remove distortions uh, that you get, much as we saw them with radar. Of course, if you uh, look optical uh, at an angle, you will still see uh, distortions, and that was that's what you see in this moving image here you'll see uh, the distortion that is created by perspective, and then you see the author rectification process, which uses a digital elevation model basically to simulate how the distortion uh, was, and then rectifies it by mapping all uh, locations back to a regular uh, coordinate grid. And that last step is normally only done with uh, very high resolution data, because um, uh, at low resolutions, first of all, the angle is usually not that high, that you get major distortions, and also you look at a coarser scale where a lot of these things are the average out. Um, but certainly with, uh, with uh, for instance, aerial photography or low flying or high resolution satellites, uh, you may need to do this depending on, uh, on your applications. Author rectification is also the reason that this image, which we saw before, looks looks uh, looks so weird, or I should say, a lack of author rectification, I suppose. So. So when you look at this image, again, it might seem that the river is floating on, on, on top of the landscape. Uh, but that's just because we're looking at it from the wrong way. So if I turn the image around like this, uh, then probably it will start to make more sense to you. It will probably look more like the you know, river is actually cut into the landscape, which is, of course, what it is. And that's because we do see the same sort of um, uh, effects of, you, know, you could call it a foreshortening in the sense, it's not really of course, but you can't see the slope here because of the perspective, it's hidden behind uh, this steep slope here. Uh, at the same time you see shadows uh, and, and, and this slope uh, on the image is, is, uh, occupies more space than it does in reality, and that's all because of the perspective of the way that we're looking at it. Um, so, you know, 
you may need to try and, uh, and correct this and of course in this case there will be an area looking from you know as if you were looking from straight uh, above there will be an area that will have no data because we basically can't see what's behind it all right so atmospheric influence is there a real pain in optical remit sensing unless uh, that's actually what you're interested in uh, and so if you want to know about the surface we have to deal with things like clouds and haze and smoke as you see in this uh, uh, collation here of uh, motor symmetry, I'm pretty sure this is, and um, that needs to be corrected. We need to try and get rid of that. You also see the effects of wind, particularly on water surfaces. You see the, the sun behind the satellite uh, casts its light and uh, causing uh, what's, known, what's known as wind. So all these uh, things we, we try to uh, avoid when we want to know about the surface. Some of the ways we do that, one, one of them is called atmospheric correction. So if we uh, know something about the um, so-called atmospheric transmittance in a particular wavelength uh, uh, that means that how much light from the Sun will get to the surface and back to the instrument then we can correct uh, you know the uh, the reflectances we can basically increase the reflectances uh, to uh, if you like uh, add back the fraction that got lost in the atmosphere uh, as I said that's very um, uh, tends to be quite wavelength dependent and so you might have to use different uh, corrections for different wavelengths um, and um, here in the equation what you see is basically what I just said so the sensor radius that which you measure is the uh, radiation that came from the Sun H in this equation um, times the transmitters how much was let through by the atmosphere uh, and then you get the surface reflectance which is usually what you want to know and then it has to go back up for, to the sensor again. So we we add we multiply with the transmittance once again, uh, and then there's this thing called the atmospheric path radiance, which is basically um, uh, scattering. So so uh, some of the uh, radiation that got uh, lost, if you like, in the atmosphere makes its way back to the sensor by a, a more diffuse path. So as you can uh, imagine, atmospheric correction can be quite complicated, uh, particularly at wavelengths uh, where it interferes a lot. With, uh, with the atmosphere uh, and, uh, and uh, things like gases and vapor. Other things we need to do is, uh, is mask out areas where we can't make such a correction. So if the cloud's too thick, we just can't see what's behind it. We're going to have to mask it out. And that's what you see in this image. And we tend to talk about different levels. So level one, level two, level three. So the top of the atmosphere reflectance implies that we haven't attempted to uh, correct or remove atmospheric influences. And that's usually called a uh, level one product, particularly um, uh, the, the the main thing that's been applied to it has been geometrically corrected and probably georeferenced. So we we know where it is, uh, but we are looking at both atmosphere and surface. Now, if we want to uh, uh, extract from that the surface reflectances, then we're going to have to do that atmospheric correction, and we're going to have to move out, uh, uh, remove clouds where they uh, are impossible, you know, where they obstruct the view. Um, and so that's uh, that's uh, what you see in this image. And I should say. Clouds on, um, themselves are an issue, but also the, the uh, shadow that they cast, as you can see here, um, that, that, that uh, really uh, plays havoc with the reflectance measurements, so we have to mask it out as well. And then a third level uh, uh, product could be where we uh, use different overpasses uh, in time uh, to construct a complete image of what we're looking at. So this uh, is often called a composite or a mosaic sometimes, uh, where we use a temporal gap filling, or we add, we look at multiple collect data collections and uh, we try to get uh, one nice complete image from that. So, for instance, the motors, we'll see a lot of motors data in this course because it's a very you know, uh, well designed data collection and easy to use. Uh, and so uh, we, can, we can see those levels again level zero, the, the, the um, the, the instrument measurements and they're not, not usually available because very few people really want to use those. Um, most of us want to use perhaps the top of the atmosphere radiance if we want to do our own corrections or maybe we're interested in the atmosphere uh, level two. Uh, we get some variables, the reflectances from the surface as well as uh, the, the bits of the atmosphere that we're seeing. Uh, and then uh, level three, we start to get uh, into the uh, compositing. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, spatial composites, for instance, the coarser scale, so I've got uh, uh, more uh, complete coverage or temporal uh, as a compositing. And then level four, we start to get sort of the products that are derived from these measurements. So we get models involved and ancillary data. 
Uh, so you might think of things like land cover classifications or vegetation properties or even flux of like elevator inspiration. Um, so these are different levels in the motor speak, but um, there's no really set standard other than to say that the, the lower level is the least, the least processed normally and the higher level are the most processed. All right, and then um, once you've got those reflectances, of course, uh, you know, after all the atmospheric correction and whatnot, uh, you can go out and measure if you're happy with what the satellite is measuring, and that's what we're doing here. So we're going out into the field with our own spectrometer. Uh, that's what I'm carrying on my back there. Uh, in my hand, I, uh, I hold a, a wand that measures the incoming radiation, uh, radiation and the, uh, the spectrum of that. Uh, and uh, I calibrate that with this little uh, reference panel here. It's got uh, very well-known reflecting properties. Then I can hold it over different land surfaces, crops, grass, and so forth, uh, and measure the um, reflectance spectrum. And that's what we then can then compare to the satellite to make sure that our surface reflectances are indeed uh, accurate. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of effort that goes into um, processing the primary uh, satellite measurements uh, uh, into um, products and data sets that, uh, that you can use and that you will be using uh, for further on in this course.